Getting a little bit closer to Christmas, but there's still more news to cover. It's time for another episode of Regan's News Round. Let's go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Regan Link here with another episode of Re Regan's News Round, where once a week, yeah, I cover seven different stories from seven different news outlets. And we'll dive straight into it, guys. And the first one we got is from The Guardian. This is exclusive from them, with the headline that legal action is planned over the UK's cruel income threshold visa rules. The exclusive reveals that thousands of families with one British partner and one from abroad will be hit by the 38,700 salary requirement. So... <clears throat> Obviously, the main exclusive is, of course, we know about the the, the plan for uh, limiting, obviously, uh, and the separation of, of families that's going to be occurring as a result of this plan, but what we don't know is about the legal action. So there are legal actions being planned on this. Will this come to anything? I don't know. I mean, the, the, the feeling that I have, really, about this is that is there going to be enough time for them? Like this is this is the kind of the way I'm looking at. It. Is there going to be enough time for all this? You know, we don't know how long Rishi Sunak is going to be prime minister for. We don't know if we're going to have. It. We they still don't know if there's going to be another leadership contest. We still don't know if we're going to have a general election sooner or later as well. And the thing, the reason why things are still up in the air is because the Rwanda bill only scraped by. And obviously, that the, um, it's bought uh, Sunak time. But there's so many factions within the Conservative Party, it's just a bit of a bit of a cluster at the moment when you think about it. But um, I, I just my heart really goes out to to the family to families here who want to from those who want to come to the UK to work in the UK to be a part uh, to contribute to the society. And this salary requirement threshold <coughs> is just going to drive away um, experts and and experts and. And high echelons of people that we we kind of need in this country at the moment because um, I I understand there's an immigration issue I, I get that but why why do we want to deny experts and and legal legal immigrants coming you know you just you you just can't win with some things but I think this this income visa threshold it, it is it is cruel it is cruel um, and it's just not it, it it's not fair. And I've talked about this before. It's not just about the. It's not just about stopping families uh, coming in with their partners coming into the UK. It's about it's it's going to force people to choose between their love. Some people, it's going to be a case of them forcing to be choosing between being with their family or being with their partner, whether it's in the UK or abroad. They're going to be forced into this issue <coughs> at no fault of their own, and that's not fair. Because of this thirty-eight thousand seven hundred salary requirement, and I just think it's it is inhumane. So let's read into it. So multinational families threatened with division or exile by new tough by tough new income thresholds for living together in the UK are planning legal action to overturn the cruel and inhumane policy. Thousands of families with one British partner and one born abroad will be hit by the government's announcement that from next spring, only people earning 38,700 will be allowed to bring family members to join them, up from 18,600. Many may be forced to either live separately or to live or to leave Britain to be together. Exactly. This is the thing. You, you, you're breaking up fa families and loved ones. <clears throat> Reunite Families, a support and campaign organisation for people affected by the immigration rule, has instructed the law firm Adelic Day to explore legal avenues to challenge the changes announced on December the 4th by the Home Secretary James Cleverley that amount to being punishing for, fall for falling in love according to one family affected. Hundreds of people whose lives could be turned upside down by the new rules have contacted the Guardian warning that they may have to leave the UK if they want to stay with foreign partners. Many working sectors with severe worker shortages such as care and social work. Yeah, I mean, the very thing here, punish for falling in love. <clears throat> punish for falling in love with someone abroad. I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's or, or in the UK coming in, it's, it's just wrong. It's just bloody wrong in every single echelon. It really, really is. One care worker, 50, said the rule was ruining our plans for a happy future. An academic, 35, said these new rules terrify me. A market manager said separating families is an atrocity. And a music teacher, of 35, facing a move, uh, facing a move to Kazakhstan, said they felt the comfort they have worked for slipping away. <coughs> 
An administrator at the University of Cambridge said she and her partner from Morocco were being kept apart by the existing salary threshold and were experiencing age-related fertility problems, meaning this whole system has basically cost us the chance to have our own family. Destroying people's lives, essentially, this is. The measurement was part was announced as part of what cleverly known as a crackdown on those who tried to jump the queue and exploit our, limit, our immigration system. <clears throat> I would say, I don't know what the percentage is, but I would say it's probably a bit small, but it, sh it still shouldn't be right that those who are coming here legally, applying legally, and, and doing all the... and contributing, and, and as well as that, it's, it's not fair on these families and people. And I'm, I'm going to keep hearing the argument all the time about we have too many too many immigrants and that, um, but... I'm I'm thinking of, I'm thinking about it from the humane side of things, and to be told this as well in the ramps of Christmas is pretty effing disgusting to say the least. Grounds for a legal challenge could include the government's handling of the impact assessment of the rule change, questioning how the new 38,700 uh, income minimum has been reached, or whether the change interferes with the rights to family under the 70-year-old European Convention of Human Rights, which the UK helped draft and remains bound by. I have never seen our community so galvanised and upset, said Caroline Coombs, the co-founder and chief executive of Reunite Families, who said the threshold was a horrendous shock for tens of thousands of British citizens and their loved ones. To declare it just before Christmas and leave people with no details is just utter cruel. It is utterly cruel. Meanwhile, new analysis shows that the doubling of the threshold means most people in large parts of the UK will no longer earn enough to live with a partner from abroad, creating a new north-south divide. Three quarters of people can afford... Uh, to bring a loved one from abroad, but under the new threshold, more than 60% will not be able to afford it, rising to 75% of northeast of England. Yeah, so basically it means only the rich people can get in. Unless you have money, unless you're filthy rich, you ain't coming in, basically, is what they're basically saying to people now. People in the northeast, Yorkshire and Humber, the northwest, East Midlands, Wales and Northern Ireland will be the worst affected, and the southeast will be least affected. Ah, the north-south divide again. Ah. We have instructed the law firm Delhi Day to advise us on potential legal avenues, Family Reunite said. Given the absolute lack of information currently provided on the policy, we want further details from the Home Secretary on the policy as a first step. The government has left open the possibility that even families already living in the UK to, together in the UK under the existing rules could be split up or have to move abroad if they do not meet the new criteria when the visa comes up for the renewal. The Home Office said it will confirm more details in due course. So those who are already here under the current rules, they haven't confirmed whether or not those will still be as if whether they'll be kicked or not. That's just like this is so unfair on people. Like those who are already here, they don't even know if they're going to be allowed to be here. But Coombs said, they need answers now, not next week or next year. For children all over the country, this is an exciting time to spend with mummy and daddy. It's just heartbreaking to know that so many caught up in this will not get a chance to be with one of them now or possibly ever. Even Scrooge and Grinch, uh, Scrooge and the Grinch <laughs> saw the light. Let's hope the government will do the same. Mm, I don't, I'm not going to hold my breath on that one. Cleverly indicated this week that the new rule should be forward-looking rather than backwards, suggesting multinational families already in the UK earning less than the salary threshold could yet be safe. Well, you haven't confirmed it yet. So the Supreme Court has previously pushed back against the government's visa rules. In February 2016, it requires changes to the way the existing minimum income rules was enforced because the government had a duty to safeguard and promote the welfare of children. In cases where an applicant for a family family visa fails to meet the income threshold, decision makers were instructed to consider exceptional circumstances, which means refusal uh, refusal breach to the rights of family life under the European Convention on Human Rights. Opposition to the threshold change has ranged from the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, who told the House and Lords he was concerned at the negative impact it will have on married and family relationships to Labour's shadow of Home Secretary Vat Cooper, who says the new rules could lead to big increases in rushed marriages in the months before they take effect. Oh, I didn't even think about the rushed marriages. That's going to force people to, to cough up their money and savings sooner just to get married, just so they don't have to face the rules as well. Again, it's just... <clears throat> The marriage guidance charity Relate told the Guardian that a rush to a cement, to cement, cement relationships because of the looming increase in the income threshold carries risks. Rushing into a long-term relationship before you feel ready to be quite traumatising can prove very di difficult, especially when there is pressure on, said Amanda Mayer, the head of service of quality and clinical practice. When one partner is saying we need to get 
uh, we need to get married to do this, it's easy to get swept along with it. It can become a bit rushed, uh, a bit blind in the rush. The Home Office said that higher salary thresholds is needed so that families members abroad joining British citizens are not burdened by the state. He said families can be exempt in exceptional circumstances where there may be unjustifiably harsh consequences for the applicant, their partner, a re relevant partner or another family member if their applicant were to be refused. <coughs> I think there's a lot of exceptional circumstances to this rule, if I'm absolutely honest. The Prime Minister has made clear that the current levels of migration to the UK are far too high, and the Home Office spokesperson said, We have a long-standing principle that anyone bringing dependents to live in the UK must be able to financially support them. The minimum income requirement ensures that families are self-sufficient instead of relying on public funds with the ability to integrate if they are to play a full part in British life. <sighs> I mean, uh, I, mean I, I, I understand that the numbers are high, but... Are we really going to to do this to to those who are to those who are still who are contributing and playing a part in society? Okay, they're not meeting such a high threshold, but still, like there's still no guarantee that those people are safe, and that this is this is so inhumane. It is inhumane and it is cruel because you are separating families. You are forcing people to break up in relationships. You are forcing people to choose between families and loved ones. You are forcing people to rush to pay for weddings that uh, for wedding services or being forced into that decision because of these new rules. So many unnecessary things are being put on the British public and people abroad who want to come and, and be a part of the United Kingdom or vice versa and whatnot. It's unnecessary stress, anxiety, mental health, all this stuff, all these emotions that are going to be ramming into them because of this bloody pathetic bill. There's no fault whatsoever to the caveat of medium and low income thresholds. Only the rich apply. Yeah, if you're rich, you're totally fine. If you're not rich, too bad is basically what they're saying. And so that's essentially how I feel about it. We'll move on, guys. So this one is from Sky News. Uh, it, I just broke at the time of recording this. So Oliver Downs stands by the Prime Minister's claims that immigration could overwhelm Europe. Yes, we're going to talk more about immigration. The Deputy Prime Minister tells Sky News that it is incumbent on mainstream politicians to recognise legitimate concerns uh, over immigration. Um, so let's 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 have a serious conversation here. So immigration is on the rise without a doubt in Europe um, but there are many factors to that um, now we've talked we've talked many times about this and I'm going to keep talking about it again so one of the first and main factors is climate change so temperatures in parts of the parts of the world have, have increased uh, which making them uh, can make them potentially uninhabitable will force them to move further north of the northern hemisphere in order to avoid burning basically uh, by the by the heat waves um, especially in the summer um, certain uh, parts of Africa and India for example are just the temperatures are just absolutely scorching even in China I mean it's it's the temperatures are, are really hard I think Australia has some of the really really hot temperatures at the moment obviously given the, the seasons for them there um, and this is gonna this is gonna put this is gonna drive people um to uh, to europe the other thing that will is also driving it is of course war um war and conflict that for some reason it's 2023 and we still have wars and conflicts um i wait i kind of i don't know why we have still have so many we've had some conflicts going on for an eternity obviously with the israel and gaza have been going on for a very long time as well um, we've had, we've had obviously we've got the conflict in Sudan. We have the uh, Yemen with, with the Houdinis. We have um, the war in Ukraine. We have um, <clears throat> there's many tribes and, and conflicts taking place in parts of Africa as well. Uh, Myanmar has been in conflict over there on the other side of the world for a long time as well. China's threatening over Taiwan. North Korea threatening nuclear war. Um, Putin. Um, Putin talking again and obviously tensions building up between Venezuelans and the, uh, Gaiwan over there over territorial dispute which is well at the moment they both said neither of them are going to go to the war but 
but any kinds of war and conflict um, forces uh, people to displace from their homes and, and to look for seek shelter elsewhere. There's also been uh, many countries now which are starting to basically banish or exile those of other nationalities in their countries, pushing them out. Pakistan were a prime example of that. They pushed out Afghans out of their country. Some of them who have been living the work, uh, living and living their home, some of them have been born there, and they got pushed out because they, they had too much immigration and uh, uh, the government there, which is quite um, uh, hard rhetoric, basically just decided to push them out and gave them a deadline, and that was it. Um, against their will so um, so there, the, there are many challenges but this is down to you know more needs to be done to help from the UN from, from world organizations to ensure that we try and bring more s peace and stability around the world but we also have to do more to tackle climate change as well um, <clears throat> and so there are a number of factors that need to be taken place and it's down to down to people basically applying the pressure to to their governments and ensuring that those who go into power are doing it not just within the best interest of the nation that they that they that they are uh, the leaders of the nation that they are but also for the for the benefit of the planet as well so i do think europe is, is starting to take a bit of a toll there's no question about it that i don't like this possibility of us locking everything down that it's just it feels wrong to do that you know and we say, well, we can't, you know, the phrase we people, I hear from all the time from people is saying, we can't take any more immigrants. And my response to you is, is like, like you have a house. Okay, this is the best example I'll put this, right? So think of yourself, you have a home, you have your family, right? Another family's come in because, have moved in with you because their home is burnt down, right? Now think of another home that has conflict or whatever, another family's moved in because it can't down, right? So obviously, another family comes and you say no, you can't take any more into your home. Yeah, that's essentially the point. That's 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 basically it, isn't it? Because you don't want to take, you can't take any more fit into your home, right? <clears throat> well, what if I told you, why don't you go and fix up their house? And then they wouldn't need to come into your home. And then you fix up their house. That means they don't need to come into your home. Imagine the other people who are already there. Imagine if you fixed up their home, they would probably leave your home and then they can go back to their home. Do you see the analogy I'm making here? See, if you, if the world is not prepared to help other nations around the world, yeah, whether it's conflict, climate change, whatever, they're not prepared to put their hands in their pockets, go out there and help these nations, these poor nations, those who are in famine, war-torn, whatever it is. If we're not prepared to go out there as a, as a world leaders, prepared to go out there and help these nations, this will only exaggerate. This is going to keep going. This is going to get worse. Yeah. If you want to drive down immigration, you need to help build the homes that they originally came from. That's what we need to do. Yeah. If you help them build their nations, build their homes, they won't need to come to your home. That's the premise that I'm trying to make here. Now, obviously, like everything, everything costs money. Of course it all does. But if you care so much about immigration, would you not rather help them build their homes so that you don't have to have them in your home? Ask yourself that question. So Rishi Sunak was absolutely right to issue a warning that immigration could overwhelm Europe, one of its ministers has claimed. Prime Minister made the remark during a right-wing conservative event in Italy on Saturday claiming enemies could use immigration as a weapon to deliberately drive in people to our shores to try and destabilise our society. Questions about the comments on Sky News uh, Sunday morning with Trevor Phillips. Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Down has said, I think that the Prime Minister was absolutely right to issue this warning, and indeed it's not just a warning, it's something that we have seen elsewhere. We have seen weaponized, the weaponization of migration, for example, in the conduct of Belarus in relation to Poland. There have been warnings from Finland in respect to the conduct of Russia. Yeah, we've talked, I've covered some short stories, obviously, about Finland closing its borders because they've been getting an influx of migration from Russia there. Um, and there's obviously also the other other place in the world that where there's uh, com uh, uh, immigration is a big problem is but the border between the US and Mexico um, but America is not doing enough to help Mex Mexico in my opinion that's that's the, the gist of it like 
if you help these South American nations, if you help Mexico, if you put more, they, they have the money and the resources to eliminate the cartel, to help build up Mexico to a much better country. If you put the money and the time into other nations and helping them, immigrants will not need to come to your country. You can't stop immigration, but you can reduce it. You have to put the time and money into it. If you're not prepared to do that, you have no right to complain about yeah the, the increase in immigration. Yeah, I'm sorry, but if I live, but if I'm living in a house where I step outside and there's gunfire going off everywhere, I don't want to stay where I am, do I? I want to be away from the gunfire where I could be in danger or my children could be in danger. Always, I always put this emphasis: put yourself in someone else's shoes before you make judgment on them. Mr. Downham also claimed there was a broader point to the Prime Minister's remarks, which is what, which is uh, that we have to reassure people that we've got control of our borders and we cannot have this unsustainable situation where we're enriching people, smugglers, the worst people on the earth, allowing this trade in human beings across the Atlantic, across the Channel. Pushed by Trevor Phillips on whether the language was extreme and be hurtful to people living in the UK with an immigrant background, the Deputy Prime Minister said he didn't think Mr. Sunak meant it in or meant it that way at all he added what the prime minister meant and indeed i think it is incumbent on mainstream politicians like myself and the prime minister and the conservative party to make sure we deal with legitimate public concerns about uncontrolled migration the main crux that people want is the cost of living crisis dealt with the economy the nhs of schools these are the things that most people are concerned about The reason why immigration is a concern is because they're making it a concern by pumping this and pumping it into the minds of people. <clears throat> the right wingers and, and the, the news constantly highlights it. The latest controversial discussion on immigration comes in the week <clears throat> where the government faces a battle within its own party to push forward its Rwanda plan, which will see asylum seekers arriving in the UK in small boats, crossings deported to the African nation. Ministers managed to win a vote in the Commons uh, in support of its Rwanda bill that seeks to ally the concerns of the Supreme Court over the scheme, following its ruling the, pol its, the policy unlawful in the courts last month. While Mr Sunak secured the, the support of the more centrist wing of the party for the bill, some on the right criticised it for not going far enough in disapplying human rights laws and 29 of them abstained on the vote. The bill will now return to the Commons for its next parliamentary stage and only, and only 27 Tory MPs would need to vote against it for it to fail. Mr Down did not rule out making changes to the legislation in order to get the right wing uh, Tories on side, even though it would risk alienating the so-called One Nation Century in this. <coughs> but he did claim the offer was on the table to get the best thing we can get. The Deputy Prime Minister also told Trevor Phillips that we will listen to our colleagues about how we can improve the legislation. Of course we will. I think this is a good piece of legislation that does the job, which was about ensuring that we control migration. Labour shadow health secretary West Street and attacked both the Rwanda plan and the Prime Minister's remarks over the weekend. He told Trevor Phillips the speech was a stunning omission of failure, adding, this is the guy who says one of my priorities is to stop the boats and they're doing a great job, great job. Then next to a minute he's off to Italy to say the quiet bit out loud, all to his right wing chums across Europe, which he is, he, which he is failing, essentially. Yeah, he is failing on it. He absolutely is. He's... Not doing, um, not doing enough on it. But like I said, guys, I said what we need to do if we want to make a change to it. Um, if we want, if we're serious about wanting to to reduce migration uh, as a whole, then the world has to seriously come together and be realist and start being realistic about what they can and can't do. I know it's very, of course, it's very, very complicated. I don't need to be told how complicated and how difficult it is to get nations on board, to get people on board to fix other nations. I, I get that. I know it's complicated. But the world came together when Nazi Germany came round. And the world can come together again. And it's just a case of just the will to do it. You know, the, we have we can change the world. And it's just a case about having the will to do it. It really, really is. It may sound dumb, but it can be done. Oh, God, I don't want to talk about this, but I have to, guys. So um, this is one from the BBC. Now, I am sceptical, obviously, because I know some people are very sceptical about the BBC, but I am going to be, I'm going to read into it because it is an interview exclusive from them. 
Michelle Monet admits she stands to benefit from the £60 million PPE profit. Michelle Monet has admitted that she stands to benefit from tens of millions of pounds of profit from personal protective equipment PPE sold to the UK government during the pandemic by a, completely, by a company led by her husband, Doug Barrowman. Right, so why don't you give that money back if it was proved to be such a failure? You know, you kind of scammed the British government and the taxpayers out of £60 million here. Don't you think you should give that money back? What makes you think you're entitled to it? Because hmm? I don't think you're entitled to it in any way, shape or form. You didn't deliver on what you said you were going to deliver. And it was way too much money. In an interview with the BBC, the couple apologised for denying for denying their roles in the deal for more than three years. So they blatantly lied, they accept they lied. But defiant Baroness Monet said, I, I don't honestly see there is a case to answer. I can't see what I've done wrong. What are you talking about? You've got £60 million in profit at the expense of British taxpayers providing shoddy PPE equipment. What do you mean you don't know what you've done wrong? You've scammed the British public out of their money. This is just, this is insulting here. This is just insulting. PPE MedPro was awarded government contracts worth more than 200 million to supply PPE to the NHS during the pandemic through a so-called VIP lane introduced to help the government choose between huge numbers and suppliers off supply supply officers offers. In November 2021, the government revealed that Baroness Money was the source of referral to the PPE MedPro, getting a place in the VIP lanes. Millions of gowns the company supplied were never used, but the couple said those were supplied in accordance with the contract. <sighs> They were not suitable. That's the problem. PP MedPro is being sued by the UK government for £122 million plus cost for breach of contract and rich unjust enrichment. Having previously denied gaining direct, direct directly from the contracts, which yielded profits of around £60 million, the former Conservative peer and lingerie tycoon admitted she and her children were benefactors of financial trust when the money is held. Baroness Money said, of course she stands to gain, adding, if my husband passes away from me, then I'm benefiting as well as my she's children and my children. She told the BBC her life had been destroyed by allegations of about their PPE profits. It doesn't look that way with that picture of you on the boat. It doesn't look like that, does it? We've only done one thing, which was lie to the press and say we weren't involved. Well, you... <sighs> You still profited out of taxpayer money. That's the problem here. She said that it was not a crime and added no one deserved this. Miss Barrowman said that Mar Baroness money was always going to benefit, uh, was always going to benefit, and my family will will benefit in due course. Her family benefit, my family benefit. That's what you do when you're in a privileged position of making money. He said, "You conned the British people. That's the problem here. The problem is you took money that was." And a way excessive amount of money. And you scammed the British public. I don't know how many times I need to put this here to you. I keep coming across like they're the, the innocent ones here. They're not the innocent ones here. Baroness uh, Moan insists that neither she or her children have seen a penny of that money that is being held in the trust. Nor that the couple have used the process of that deal to buy a yacht, she said. Okay. All right. Sure, sure, sure. We'll believe that. She also suggested she would not benefit if, God forbid, we are getting divorced after this show. <laughs> Sorry, just had to check something there. The Scottish businesswoman was made a Conservative peer by David Cameron, but is no longer in the party. <sighs> the couple confirmed to the BBC that they had been under investigation by the National Crime Agency, ongoing for two and a half years, she said, and they had both been interviewed once. They also confirmed this investigation was into conspiracy to defraud, fraud and false representation and bribery. The couple admitted to the BBC that they had lied about their involvement uh, with PP MedPro. Uh, she said, I, sh I should have said I'm involved straight away, but I didn't want the press intrusion for my family. My family had gone through hell with the media over my career. I didn't want uh, another big hoo-ha. Well, it wouldn't have been a big hoo-ha if you just come clean. But you, you don't want the public to know that you're scamming the pub they're scamming them. They first made the admission that they were linked to a deal during the documentary funded by the company and posted online. Baroness Moan and Barrowman told the BBC they were upfront straight with people and apologised for not telling the truth at the start, saying we both regret that 
that we didn't. Mr. Bowman said that he had led the PPE MedPro consortium, even though he is not listed at the company's house and having connections to the family. He told the BBC that he was, in effect, ultimately beneficial owner of the firm, the person who ultimately owns and controls the company. Baroness Malone is also on investigation by the House of Lords for not declaring her interest in PPE MedPro. She told the Sunday with Lord of Queensburg that show that the cabinet uh, office officials had told her that she had to declare her interest to them, not to the House of Lords. So, that the government knew and not told us as well, just to add insult to injury. She said, I discussed it with the cabinet office and you do not declare your interest in the House of Lords if you are not a director, not a shareholder and not financially benefiting. Baroness Malone claimed that an official suggested yeah, just declare your interest to us. That's exactly what I did. I did everything they asked me to do. Again, just don't, not, not buying it at all. She said the cabinet office clearly felt there were a perceived conflict because you have an unusual situation of husband and wife team being together. He told the BBC that uh, PP MedPro had agreed two contracts to the value of £202 million, making a 30% profit, which is around £60 million, which is described as a good return. £202 million. Crowd, you can tell this is... You can scream that this is all wrong. Mr. Bowerman said there had been no guarantees that PP MedPro would be paid until the mask and gown had been supplied, adding that the risks were absolutely extraordinary. He denies that the deals were profiteering, saying that he had presented very uh, comp comprehensive prices for the taxpayer. No, you ripped us off. The Department of Health launched his claim against PP MedPro, which is separate to be uh, separate to the criminal investigation being carried out by the NCA a year ago. Mr. Barrowman alleged that the government official had suggested he handed over a significant amount of money to call off the dogs, which he took in to took to mean to end the criminal investigation. He said they asked me if I would pay more for the other. For the other matter to go away, I was speechless. I was absolutely gobsmacked. An NCAA spokesperson said the NCA opened an investigation in May 2021 into suspected criminal offences committed by the procurement of PPE contracts by PPE MedPro. The NCA is operationally uh, independent of our investigation and our intelligent led. The Department of Health would not comment. No, of course they won't. The couple said that the government's handling of the PPE had been shambolic. We're not going to read any more of it, guys. I think yeah, we've we've heard enough of what they had to say. Um, I just think it's it's completely shambolic and uh, pretty pretty pathetic, really. Um, Sixty million pounds. It's two hundred and two million pounds. Sorry, is what what is what I feel has been shammed out of here. It's way 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 too much money to have been given to them in the first place. It should never have gotten gave them to them. And uh, we, I, I think we should be getting all of that money back, if I'm honest. Um, not just the £60 million, pounds, but the, the, the contract in full, really. I just think it's an absolute sham, the whole lot of it. Um, but I don't, but we'll have to wait and see, obviously. I have to say, it's all allegations, because nothing's been proven. But even though The Guardian have quite a bit of information on it, to be fair. But I think we've heard enough of what we need to hear from them, if I'm honest. So about 33 minutes in, so let's break it up a little bit, guys. Let's listen to a bit of Matt Green to kind of um, lighten the mood. Oh, just, yeah, yeah, just to lighten the mood here, guys. I'll make sure I put that there. No, I don't think I'm tetchy. I, I, I don't know where this has come from. I, I'm not tetchy. I'm just passionate about what I believe in. What do you mean I sound like an apprentice candidate? What I believe in is sending some random asylum seekers to Rwanda, because it's a gimmick that one of my many predecessors came up with and, well, I don't have any better ideas. I've actually been Prime Minister for over a year now, which is actually quite a big achievement, right? No, I'm not angry or upset or tetchy. Oh, Keir made a joke, did he? Yeah, yeah, but it was a funny one. <laughs> No, I, I did understand it. Yeah, I did, once it was explained to me. Yeah. Of course I'm fine. You know, think about my life. I've always been top of my class, uh, successful, rich, you know, unlike some prime ministers. All I'm saying is that, you know, being PM, it's, it's actually quite hard sometimes. Maybe, sometimes, a thank you would be nice. I mean, what does techy even mean? I don't recall being called techy before. Actually, let me... Nope, I don't recall it. They're saying I'm as unpopular as Liz Truss. I mean, come on, that can't be right. Of course I've made progress. Did I stop the boats? No. Do I wish I hadn't used the word stop and instead something like reduce? No, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine with it. I'm not tetchy. Sorry, who was it who called me tetchy? No reason, no reason. I'm just interested. It's interesting, isn't it? 
and the police have got a few new powers they haven't used yet. Could you say that insulting a prime minister is terrorism? In a way. I mean, it's arguable, isn't it? I mean, don't ask the BBC. <laughs> don't make me tetchy. You wouldn't like me when I'm tetchy. <laughs> but seriously, I'm not tetchy. Do you think they meant titchy? Because, I mean, then that is that is unfair. That is an unfair crack about my height. And I think I'd be well within my rights to be quite upset. That, no, it was, it was tetchy. It was definitely tetchy. Right, okay, okay, okay that's fine. Because I'm not that. Christmas? Well, I suppose it would be nice to have a bit of a break, won't it, with the family? Get away from all of my loyal MPs going around backstabbing everywhere. <laughs> Apparently there's a new lot I have to worry about now, the Conservative Common Sense Research Group. wonder where they're doing their research. Local weather spoons? <laughs> no, I'm not, not that I'm saying there's anything... I've never been to one myself, but... But I imagine that, and I'll probably have another by-election to deal with, and that's that's fine. I'm looking forward to that because one of my MPs is corrupt, apparently, and that's fine. It's good. Bring it on. I love a by-election. There's nothing else I'd rather do. It's not like there's anything else important on my desk. <laughs> I wonder if Elon's got time for another chat. I mean, he can be tetchy. Is this tetchy enough for you? <laughs> is it tetchy enough? Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's tetchy enough. Matt Green, guys, make sure you subscribe to Matt Green. Uh, go watch the video, give him a like, the usual stuff, guys. Um, we love, we do love a bit of Matt Green, that is for sure, guys. That is for sure. Uh, let me just make sure this is up to date. Guys, while you're here as well, don't forget to hit the like button, share across social media, and hit that bell notification icon so you're notified when I upload another video. And also, subscribe. It does help to support the channel, guys. Get me one step closer to YouTube membership, which I would really, really like to get to at, at some point. So all that stuff really does help support the channel. So the next one we got is an exclusive from iNews, you guys. With a headline that the NHS is paying out £800 million in damages over babies suffering brain damage during birth. More than 200 successful brain damage claims were settled by the NHS Trust in England over the last six years with more than £800 paid out in damages. This is a terrible... Um, thing for any mothers to have to go through um 800 million pounds how has this been why is this so high now is this down now obviously we haven't read the article but this is i imagine that some of this will be down to perhaps poor handling of doctors and nurses maybe perhaps um not having the equipment there could be a lot of factors into it um and I will say that eight hundred million pounds is a lot of money, you know, a lot, a lot of money to pay out. But putting all that aside, um, think of the parents um, and their children and their babies. Here is what we need to think about, you know, them for them to have to go through through that um, is uh, pretty horrible during birth as well. Um, I'm. I just think um, it, it is a lot of money, you know. Let's read into it to get a better understanding. So almost 400 successful claims for birth injuries resulted in cerebral pastry were settled by NHS Trust in England over the last six years with more than £1.5 billion paid out in damages data has revealed. Some 397 successful claims were made by relatives of babies born injured with cerebral palsy. Unusually a result of a failure to deliver an infant when there are clear indicators. Okay. More than 200 successful brain damage claims were settled by NHS Trust in England over the last six years with more than £800 million paid out in damages. The first most costly sets of claims were for wrongful birth. The legal term described to claim generally bought by parents arising from a birth of a child who has not uh, who have not have been born without negligent treatment with 42 cases uh, settled resulting in damaging payouts totaling 145 million pounds the health services paid out several billion pounds in damages between april 2017 and april 2023 when the most common successful claims resulting from families of babies who are stillborn born with cerebral pasture who suffer from unnecessary pain during birth the data was, was obtained from NHS resolution, which deals with claims from compensation on behalf of the NHS in England by the clinical uh, negligence firm being let down. Part of the Bond Turner Law, Bond Tuna Law, Law Firm, which also shows some 730 brain damage claims were made during the six year period, making it the most common injury claim. Such claims can take more than 10 years to settle and many will still be under investigation. 
NHS Revolution's latest uh, annual accounts show a total of £2.6 billion was spent on clinical negligence payments in 2022-2023, up from £2.4 billion 2021-2022. Why is it getting worse then? What, why is it? Why is it? Why is it getting worse? What? 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 Are we, what are we, what's? What are we doing to reduce this? Prevent this? Is the question I'm 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 asking. Been let down. Said he wants to investigate NHS clinical negligence claims further after analysis of care quality. Commissioned the CQC records deeming two thirds, sixty seven percent of maternity units are not safe enough, and up from fifty five percent last year. Okay, so the first of all, they're not deemed safe enough. I'm pretty sure lack of staffing would be another thing as well. Helen Neville, Deputy Head of Clinical Negligence at the law firm, said, As with any sorts of medical care or procedure, complications are going to arise and inevitably these will sometimes have tragic consequences. However, parents shouldn't be left to bear the lifelong burden of medical negligence. The early notification scheme is certainly a positive step towards early investigation into brain injuries at birth, but we've had instances where families have not been informed and there was an investigation being held and they have not formed part of it. The scheme should work to support parents that affect his staff and should enable the NHS to, to share information across trust to help avoid the same insidious insin reoccurrence. This simply is not happening. Yeah, so it's, I just, I'm just trying to think, is it not, I'm just, I'm asking myself right now, is any of this tied down to the lack of funding lack of austerity the lack of doctors and nurses in, in there is any of this lack uh, linked to it and right now my answer is probably not but i could easily be wrong on that this is never point to a series of maternity scandals in recent years a trust be a trust in shrewsbury not in the east kemp as evidence that lessons were not being learned and shared throughout the nhs been let down are one of a smaller number of law firms assisting in another maternity investigation the Frywall inquiry dealing with countless, uh, or countless, countless of Cheshire Hospital and identifying learning following events at that hospital. Ms Neville said uh, more needs to be done to properly fund maternity services to do and to ensure working conditions for midwives are sustainable or else parents will continue to be let down on maternity wards across the country. There needs to be an investment in training and in training the culture of the NHS and in the sharing information so that lessons can be learned. Failure in maternity care can have a long-lasting and devastating impact on women, their babies and their families. Having been working in this field since 2005, I have seen, I've seen the same mistakes over and over again and this is unacceptable. Data also shows the top uh, 20 trusts who have received the most claims against them, although officials said this inevitability reflects the larger trust where the most birth place takes place, uh, takes place every year. A spokesperson for the NHS resolution which deals with claims for compensation on behalf of the NHS in England has said, NHS Revolution's data does not show an increase in birth injury claims, but rather that instances would have would have taken years to be reported are now being reported and investigated far earlier. This is a direct result of NHS Resolution Early Notification Scheme for Obstetric Cerebral Pathology, which accelerates investigation and learning and gets answers for much needed support to families or sooner. NHS Resolution works closely with families and their respectives throughout. I'm kind of a bit... Um, I don't know if this is, is it really, is it, what is, doesn't say specifically in the, in the article for me, like, what are the main causes of, of this? You know, reading that, and I'm, I'm saying to myself, okay, so what, what are we doing to stop this? What are we doing to prevent this? What, what are we learning from this? Is, is, I'm really torn on this, you know, because, like, when these things happen, obviously, without a question, there needs to be compensation paid. If there's an investigation that finds that there has been there has been negligence, obviously, during the birth, then uh, negligence during the birth that has caused this damage, then obviously compensation needs to be paid. Where is the what what where is the detail here? I'm not seeing enough detail for me to say what are the main causes of this. Like, is it poor training? Is it because there's not enough people in the room is it because of the equipment what are the what are some of the main reasons that are causing this and what's being done to help reduce the numbers you know these are these are the questions i'm kind of asking here and i don't see an answer right now and i don't know if, if what one of these may 
maybe answers or maybe some of you in the comments might have a better answer. Like, I don't see a straightforward answer here. <sighs> but I do think it's a, it's a frustrating one because it's costing the NHS huge amounts of money as well as it's costing untold pain and suffering on mothers, uh, mothers having to go through that as well. So it, there needs to be a resolution to this. Now, I'm not saying you can't stop it outright, but... There needs to be there needs to be more needs to be done to ensure it's reduced. That is for sure, guys. Okay, the next one we got is from the Independent. So the headline is: Ministers do not deny plans to curb the use of social media by under 16s. The plans could see teenagers require required to gain parents' permission before also setting up account on sites, according to reports. Okay, let me read more into this before I really jump ahead on what what what's this is about. To be fair. So Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Down did not deny reports that the UK government is considering restricting the use of social media by under 16s. It has been reported that the government is considering launching a consultation in the new year around possible restrictions being placed on those under the age of 16 using social media platforms in an effort to bolster UK online safety laws. According to the reports, the plan could see a teenager requiring to gain a parent's permission before setting up an account on sites such as Facebook, Instagram and TikTok. Okay, um, I mean, if they put in their correct date of birth, then I don't see an issue here. But the thing is, is that this is not going to stop kids going online. And it will just basically mean kids will just go on other social media websites that... Are that can get out of these laws or go around these laws. This is not going to work, basically. Kids are still going to be kids. Still going to going to find ways around this. I think this is not, this is this is this is not necessary. But I I have talked about when we talked about um the you that we had a, I had a video a while ago about uh, parents and about the use of ID and age verification and ID for. Uh, those to access uh, pornography content and websites and such things, and my general consensus is that there should be there should be more barriers put up. Now, people argued in the comments that they're still going to go out of their ways to do them. Well, that's fine then. You know, well, I'd still put the barriers up because you, you, because you you will reduce you obviously if people want to go out of their way to go for it, they'll go for it, but it will also stop. I also believe it will also stop the numbers. Now, this this seems incredibly harsh because, especially for young teens, I don't think sixteen is the right age as well. I think I think there should be an age, but I don't think sixteen should be. I think it should be a bit less, um, because kids need to be able to allow to be kids. But I also don't think it's right that ten year olds are also ten year olds or uh, maybe. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, but I think, yeah, there needs to be a, a line of when kids should be able to freely uh, use these social media accounts at certain ages. You know, is it okay at 14? Is it okay at 13? What about 10-year-olds? Where Where is the line do you see where they can access these social media accounts is, is a question I have for you guys. What, what would your age would you regard it being okay? Where it's like, okay, the kid, child should not be on it at, what, nine years old? On Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, like where is where, where is that line? I think it's the question I'd like you guys to say in the chat, because I'm not 100 percent sure on that line. I think it. Sh I think this could work at a much lower age, but I don't think 16 is necessary. There is a real worry from parents about how they can protect their children from the harms of social media. Arthur Barry on Sunday morning with Trevor Phillips' program on Sky News said, "You'll have to wait for the announcement in that area." I don't think we've actually made a formal policy announcement. He added, what I do think is that I saw this and when I was digital secretary, when I see it speaking in my constituency and elsewhere, there's a real worry from parents about how they can protect their children from the harms of social media. Now, of course, as a conservative, I don't want to reach a level of banning, but we need to look at how we can protect children online. And I think there's a reason the government should do that. I do think there there is a consensus of that. Um, we do want to protect children online, but where is the line? And I don't think 16-year-old is the right line, in my opinion. Science Minister Andrew Griffin last week said it was about a consultation that is rumoured to happen in the new year, and it's called Only Speculation. Yeah, and that's all they've got on it. 
So, yeah, what do you guys think on that? I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure on that one. No, I think, I think the age is wrong. I think it should be. I think it is something we should discuss, but I don't think 16 years old is right. I think 16 year old they they have a, a decent enough mindset, and you're not going to stop them at that age getting on social media. But a bit lower than that, 14, 13 maybe. I don't know. Uh, the age gap varies. I know, but I do think we should try to detract children from social media as much as possible um, when they're really, really young. Um, but as they get older, they are going to get into it, whether you like it or not. But it's about how you as a parent manage it and the schools manage it, unfortunately. But where is that line? I think it's the question we need to ask ourselves. So the next one is not an article, but it's an opinion piece, guys, from someone we are very familiar with. Will Rishi die on his immigration hill? This is Sunak's policy on migration has become a farce, but he keeps ploughing on. By guess who? Zoe Gardner. Yes, Zoe Gardner, guys. Um, I'll put a link to her YouTube channel in the description. And uh, I'll put her Twitter link as well. If you have Twitter as well, do give her a follow. An immigration, uh, independent immigration policy expert. Um, she really does know her stuff. And I w we wanted to read read this. Um, I really wanted to read this. And I haven't had a chance to do it. I know it's quite a couple of days old, to be fair. But I wanted to read it. And I uh, hope you guys find it as interesting as I intend to. Because I have not yet had a chance to read it. So, the Conservatives appointed Rishi Sunak leader of the Tory party a little over a year ago, hoping he would rescue them from the mess in his predecessors had made. The economy was in terrible shape, public institutions and services were in chaos, and the NHS waiting lists were the highest they'd ever been at any point over the past 15 years. Opinion poll after opinion poll put these issues at the forefront of British public concern. Immigration was also prominent at, in the polls, but in a more nuisant way in the, than in the early years. British attitudes towards migration have actually been improved. This year, for the first time, only a minority of people want immigration to be reduced. What continues to worry them is the issue of small boats. These bubble people, even though they are a small portion of overall arrivals, the reasons are varied, but not all negative. Most people don't like seeking, seeing refugees' lives at risk, while others simply desire a sense of order. Not everybody uh, worried about the boats wants to prevent unvulnerable people from seeking protection in the UK. So Sudak has had the option for where to get started. He chose to continue tiring the party's identity by reducing migration by the harshest means possible. In the process, he tied a noose in which he's strangling his own chances of re-election. House in its own making. Sunak inherent both high legal migration numbers, especially arrivals for work and study, and the small boats crisis. And while one could argue that, as Chancellor, he had at least a hand in the former he could have approached in the latter which can relatively clean slate instead he redoubled his commitment to his predecessor's contradictory mismanaged gimmickry starmer should watch closely if elected he too will inherit an ungodly mess on migration whether he changed himself to hostility in the same way that sunak may as well will make or break his chances nobody trusts the government on immigration not because everybody wants the same thing but because it consistently feels like an amateur hour he puts. Sunak has tried out a number of different images since becoming Prime Minister in October 2022. He's been a safe pair of hands steadying the ship, the change candidate ready to confront old legacies and even the conciliar and continuate candidate. None of these variants of the real Rishi landed, partic landed particularly favourably. Perhaps because he had been all been dominated by the same message, this PM, more than anything else, will prove himself to voters through his hostility to migrants. How well is that going, Prime Minister? <sighs> the reason for this we can only assume is that he is judged to whipping up anger around migration to be a cheaper, easier, quicker route to vote than improving the ec economy or unclogging the NHS, and he, even, and he needed speed. As the third Tory Prime Minister of this term, Sunak has never had a lot of time on his side. But all those changes in self-presentation were also opportunities to change tack. He could see the Rwanda plan wasn't going well. If he hadn't been blinded uh, by an obsession with migration, he could have switched to other stories that made he and his Tories many failures at the least less obvious. Inflation has dropped, and despite the government having little to do with it, Sunak had a chance of pinching the Tories as the party of recovery. 
The autumn statement was another chance to sell economic success and Hunt gave it a go by presenting tax cuts paid for the future spending cuts to public service as another win. By each time within days, sometimes even hours, another story of chaos at the Home Office drowned out by every other conversation. It's all in the cell. Sunak appears to have spent his first year as Prime Minister assuming he would get away with running historically high rates of net migration while loudly shouting about bringing the numbers down. Doing so was an unnecessary act of self-harm. He would have likely have been fine if he consistently if he had given consistently a shot at level with the public about the needs of the economic and the health and the care sector. Both are more important to voters than the number of immigrants. This is 100% true by her. Um, the numbers are way too... While well, immigration, sorry, I'm trying not to sneeze. Mm, one... Okay, I think I passed it. Sorry about that. Similarly, um, I think I passed it. I can't tell, guys. I'm really sorry. Um, yeah, she's absolutely right. People are more concerned about the economy and NHS and health. The care sector. Uh, than immigration. And there have been numerous polls that are showing this, that people are more concerned about these things than immigration. Similarly, high immigration numbers would have been much less damaging if he had presented them as part of a solution to the problem by bringing in taxation, billions of foreign student contributions, needing labour, rather than suggesting that they're an aberration. Or worse, claiming that dropping them is his plan for fixing the economy. Nobody trusts the government on immigration, not because everybody wants the same thing, but because it consistently feels like amateur hour. It wants to claim low numbers achieve the opposite and see, and seem surprised. Cruelty as a vo vocation. More surprising still is Sunak's choice of plans to pin his entire career to the success of the failure of the Rwanda deal. Let's not forget Priti Patel announced this half-baked distraction deal when she was Home Secretary in Boris Johnson's government. Experts on both sides of the debate warned it was likely doomed from the start and it would have little impact on the irregular migration if it ever got off the ground. Sunak has given the Rwanda government millions, undermined the British courts, disdained the international law and is now trying to pass legislation state in that fiction is fact. Yeah, that's the whole problem with this all. Sunak could have completely disavowed it. He could have turned to more evidence-based policy after the court appeal found it unlawful or after the Supreme Court delivered its damning judgment or when he sacked the, his Home Secretary, or when his Immigration Minister resigned. There were chances to switch gears. Hell, he could even say enough is enough tomorrow and still have the chance of redeeming himself in the eyes of good chunks of the electorate. But nothing signals hostility like the front pages showing a few hundred terrified foreigners being shipped away to a faraway African country for life. Sunak apparently can't resist the allude of that image, which he clearly believes will be enough to save him from all the rest of his failures and humiliations. It's not going to make a difference! And so he ploughs on. He gives his Rwanda government millions, undermines the British courts, disdain international law, and is now trying to pass legislation stating that fiction is fact. Caught in an undignified open battle with the rabbit far right of his party, he chose to plunge down the rabbit hole of absurdity with his eyes wide open. Sunak can't seem to stop digging. His best case scenario by this point would be to pass through the centre of the earth and emerge in Australia, where the Stop the Boat slogan actually had some political success. But given his track record, he'd probably uh, just pop out in the middle of the English Channel to have a swim ashore. We'll just have to wait and see. His zombie government may limp through to pass a new bill and for unknown millions of pounds more. He may even manage to get a few people into one of those flights. But in pursuing this, he may have left the vast majority of the British public far behind trying to get a GP appointment. And when he is defeated, as he surely will be, it will end a dramatic fall for great of a politician who has seen as a force for reckoning with just 18 months ago, a lesson for Labour, laid bare lies easily becomes tripwise. We need an honest conversation about migration at last. We do need an honest conversation about uh, migration at last. That was a very nice piece there by Zoe Gardner, guys. Um, also, as well, if you can, also, if you can denote, donate and contribute to Open Democracy as well, um, any support for them would be greatly appreciated as well. Um, I'll leave a link in the description if you guys want to contribute and support them as well. So guys, just before I go to the last article, because I know we're on the hour mark, um, if you can hit the like button, be greatly appreciated. Share across social media, hit that bell notification icon to be notified of when I upload another video. 
And if you want to also uh, financially support me, you can do so by buying me a coffee or joining me on Patreon as well. The links are in the description. So any of that stuff would be greatly appreciated, guys. So finally, this is the last one for us, guys. Um, Prince Harry. This one from Barline Times. Get in the way of murder. What Harry's win against Amira means for Murdoch and the Mail. So yes, Prince Harry had beat uh, the one... Uh, Big battle a few days ago against the Daily Mirror. So the judgment of uh, Justice Fancourt established a clear link between the criminal media nexus, uh, nexus of corrupt cops, journalists, and the murders of Stephen Lawrence and Daniel Morgan to feature in trials next year. Oh boy, this battle has still got a long way to go. Um, obviously, Piers Morgan, who was the uh, editor at the time, basically claimed that he didn't know nothing of this and tried to tried to play it down and whatnot, but you know we see we see we see what's going on here and uh all i'll say is guys before i read into it i hope he beats them uh i hope he really does because the media needs a right kick in the mainstream that's for sure because they don't do their jobs they're doing it to enrich and benefit themselves rather than for the benefit of the country all nations hidden in today's voluminous high court judgment uh, that's the date the date of it of the case of Prince Harry against the Mirror Group's newspapers in finding which breaks open what Golden, what Gordon Brown called the criminal media nexus of corrupt cops, tabloid journalists and private investigators and the dark arts that come to dominate the British press. The evidence of one important witness, Derek Hamslim, will be the key to cases against the Murdoch and Mail newspapers due for trial next year. Oh, they'll want to silence him, won't they? Uh, Derek Hausman, a former Met detective, was tasked to go undercover in 1997 for the Met's internal ghost squad inquiry into police corruption to investigate the unsolved murder of Danny Morgan, a private investigator who many believe to have discovered a major story of police corruption. He was pitched into newspapers before being axed to death in the South, Lon uh, South London pub car park. Hamsland's target was Daniel Morgan, Morgan's old private detective agency. Seven investigators and the two men there were originally suspected, arrested on suspicion of involvement in his murder. The firm's co-founder, Jonathan Reese, and the former Met detective, Sergeant Sid Philly. The Mirror and the Daniel Morgan murder suspect. <coughs> Justice Fancourt ruling in the High Court lays out Haslam's evidence. Mr Derek Haslam, who operated as an undercover surveillance officer, was instructed to watch Jonathan Reese, the, the joint owner and, and operator of Southern Investigations, was said Finley, with regards to activities with corrupt police officers and an investigation into the unsolved murder of Danny Morgan. Mr. Halloween said that the Reese that Reese boasted of obtaining information by phone tapping and computer and phone hacking and admitted to them that he had helped supply phone hacked information to MGM. He said that Reese had employed BT engineers to tap landlines. However, it's clear that Mr. Hallam's evidence that the majority of Reese's information was obtained by other illegal means. Mr. Haslam said that, that Reese is frequent, frequently met with journalists and corrupt police officers in pubs bragging about the working for the Mirror and the Sunday Mirror, and that he had been introduced by Glee to Gary Jones of the Mirror and Doug Kempler of the Sunday Mirror. He said that both were clearly good customers of Reed and that he spoke about them often, and in particular boasted about having supplied information about Prince, about Prince Michael of Kent's bank account, which was unlawfully obtained. In cross-examination, Mr. Hudson was able to recall which pubs meetings with Reese and Philly would take place, and said that Jones and Kempster would come on occasions. On occasions, there was a blank bank manager called Rob there as well, as policeman was known as Rob the Bank. The Gary Jones mentioned is currently the editor of the Express newspaper. He was a crime reporter of the News of the World in the 90s when the Sunday tabloid was under the editorship of Pierce Morgan and the main employer of Rees and Philly. When Morgan moved to the Mirror Group, when he took Gary Jones with him. But the uh, but by then, the police had installed a bug in the premise of the private detective agency. On the 6th of June, July 1999, when Jones was a senior reporter at the Daily Mirror, he was caught on tape querying involves totaling £16,991 that some of the investigations had billed the Mirror. This is tiresome, effering tiresome, Reese told Jones. We're not going to put the numbers in there because of what, they're, because what we are doing is illegal, isn't it? I don't want people coming in and nicking us for criminal offence, you know. 
Today's judgment, among other things, vindicates the suppressed evidence. Justice Fancourt accepted Hallison's evidence in broad terms and called his testimony clear and compelling. But this is only the beginning of the story behind Haslam's evidence and is also a key testimony in more trials due next year brought by several claimants including Prince Harry, Elton John and Hugh Grant over unlawful information gathered against the mail and a mail group and Murdoch's publications. And this also sets up a whole issue of police and press corruption around the murders of Stephen Lawrence and Daniel Morgan. The Murdoch Connections and Corrupt po Policy. <coughs> Excuse me. It's no coincidence that two of the most notorious murders in the last half century occurred within a few miles of each other in South East London. The assassination of private investigator Daniel Morgan in the car park of the Golden Lion pub in Sigenham in 1987 and the racist murder of, of teenager Stephen Lawrence in Eltham in 1993. Back in the 80s and 90s, the proximity be between those corrupt police officers and the national press was so extensive that the area known as the News of the World Regional Crime Squad the senior lum luminosity had come out in the area. Commander Ray Adams was described at the time as Rupert Murdoch's yard man. He went on to become deputy head of security for the NDS, a global security aim for Murdoch's News Corp. In the meantime, over the past three decades, the murders of Daniel Morgan and Stephen Lawrence were subject to dozens of more parallel and problematic police investigations. <coughs> In 1998, McPherson's inquiry into Stephen Lawrence's murder concluded that the Metropolitan Police was guilty of institutional racism and independent review by Mark Easton, KC, in 2014. Around the phone hacking scandal and the established police corruption was a factor too. Similarly, the Daniel Morgan Independent Panel Inquiry, led by Baroness alone, concluded in 2021 that the UK's largest police force suffered from institutional corruption. The News of the World was the main customer of the Southern's investigation for almost 20 years and Reese and Philly trained and supported his star reporter. Mel's own manhood as he went undercover for nine years has then reported back to his handlers about the array of unlawful information gathered services available to Reese and Philly. Moonlighting police covert entries were for breaking. A BT engineer to tap phone lines, a bank employee to access confidential financial statements. We can get the Queen's medical records, has then recalled Reese once boasting. But most disturbing of all was, was the ready to access the former or serving Met police officers who could be bought off for unlawful information. Haslam reports about unlawful news gathering and the probe in the premise of the Southern investigators caused a stir in the Met. Commander Bob Quick uh, drew up a secret intelligence report in details 46 media crimes and recommended the arrest of two News of the World journalists, Alex Murchuk and Masley Manhut and Doug Kempter from the Mirror. But quick senior officers in the Met did, did nothing about the report. Indeed, several of them went on to accept paid columns in the Murdoch newspaper. Ah, funny that, funny that. The Mao and the Stephen Lawrence murder. More startling and surprising is Haslam's evidence against ANL, the publishers of the Daily Mail and the Mail on Sunday. He said Reese and Philly were major suppliers of unlawful information to the Mail titles who were interested in finding out if Doreen Lawrence and her campaign for justice had been infiltrated by left-wing groups. Again, the major source for Southern investigation stories were corrupt cops. Among the dozen of officers in regular communication during Reese and Philly during their hey heyday, were two men who played an important role in the original Stephen Lawrence murder investigation. Commander Ray Adams and his bagman DC John o John uh, Davison, that's OJ, having left the force both to become in both became, in Haslam's word, security consultants and important subcontractors for Southern investigations. In January, the print edition of Byline Times, Jake Atold puts more puts together some of the new evidence of linking Davison and Adams to both the Morgan and Lawrence cases, and former Guardian crime reporter Duncan Campbell and investigative journalist and whistleblower Dan Evans reclick the former Flying Squad detective John Roche, who also specialised in selling information to the Mail and other newspapers from corrupt serving officers, and was also targeting Doreen Lawrence according to Haslam. Haslam has already been the subject of spurious attacks by Fleet Street journalists because of his evidence doesn't suit their industry or agenda. They were rather muddy the investigation into an infamous race, this stabbing and an axe murder with a low-level character assassination and hatchet jobs against key witnesses. This is a disservice to the presence 
to the present as well as recent history and shows much of the British press is more intent on deceiving their readers rather than informing them. They are trying to get away with murder. This is why um, this battle that Prince Harry had uh, and his uh, uh, other celebrity co co colleagues are so important. They're so important to be uncovered and to be uh, for what they have done and the damage that they have caused, guys. And um, I will consistently be keeping an eye on it, whether it's short feeds or my video. Um, th this is a battle that they need to win, in my opinion, uh, for the sake of freedom. Uh, and the, the, the British establishment really don't speak for the British public. They do it within the interests of their own rather than us. And we need to change that. And I do hope that if Labour do come into power, they will change it for the better. But we will have to wait and see on that, guys. And we've gone well over time. But that is the end of Regan's News Round. What did you guys think of some of the stories we covered today? Let me know in the comment section down below what you guys thought as well. Before you go, if you can, hit the like button. be greatly appreciated. Share this across social media. Hit the bell notification icon so you'll be notified when I upload another video. And of course, if you can want to financially support me, which I would greatly appreciate around this Christmas time, you can do so by buying me a coffee or joining me on Patreon. Both the links are down in the description, guys, if you want to do that for me. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to catch you all very, very soon.